Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're excited to bring to you math activities for students who hate math. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make those tough to teach, tough to learn concepts, accessible to all my students. Tonight, we're lucky to be joined by our panelist, Ellen Pikarski. Her students call her Miss Pi, and growing up, Ellen didn't even consider becoming a math teacher like myself because teachers either had to deal with running noses or wet pants, or they had to give boring lectures all day. After she received her bachelor's degree, she was asked to teach a group of teenagers at her church, and that's where Ellen discovered her love of teaching older kids and was reminded of how much she loves math. Ellen went back to school and started her journey in education. So Ellen, we're excited to have you with us tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mike. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Ellen using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. And we'll also be using the chat window tonight to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues, but in the event that you do, check down at the bottom of your screen, there's an audio broadcast button. You can toggle that on and off. At this point, Ellen is gonna discuss our agenda. All right, guys. Uh, so um, the way I've set up this presentation, Mike just did the welcome and the introductions. I'm gonna go over uh, who I am a little bit and then talk about who are our students who hate math. Um, most of them have some of the same type of characteristics, so we'll go over that a little bit. Uh, then I'll talk about why we need to teach math through math activities or math projects, and then how to go about it. Um, and you know, teaching teaching uh, project-based learning or math activities with students who love math is going to be very different than teaching somebody that doesn't like math. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And then at the end, please stick around. We have a webinar drawing. Mike, you want to explain about that? Thanks, Ellen. Yeah, at the end, we'll be uh, giving away to one lucky winner a T-Cubed summer, uh, summer Workshop registration. So that'll be towards the end of the webinar tonight. So Ellen, let me give you control. And feel free to share your screen. All right. All right, everyone. So um, this is my lovely picture on the left. Have every hey, Ellen, you I don't think you're sharing your screen yet. Can you double check that? There we go. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So um, I hope you enjoy my the pictures of me. I have on the left side. I have a very lovely very professional picture of me. And then on the right side, I have a picture of me tagging an abandoned car. Um, and so I have a very professional picture and then a not so professional picture. And so the first question I have for you guys is why do you think I'm showing both pictures? Go ahead and just think about it. Why do you think I'm showing both my, um, my very professional and not so professional picture up here? You just put your answers in the chat box. And Mike, can you just read off some of those for me? I sure can. So I saw uh, showing your humility, that we are more than just educators. Great. Help students relate to you, more than just one side to everyone, opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> Uh, show that you're a real person. I'm sure that was a compliment. Uh, casual awesome. and work, you. uh, showing your human side, uh, that you have a life outside of school, which I didn't. I don't think my students think I do. Um, <laughs> right. Allow students yeah, to get perfect. to know your interests. Yeah. Very good. Perfect. So, so Mike, that that's a perfect lead-in. So most of our probably think that we're just this robot that stays in our math classroom and 
we eat, sleep, and breathe math. We don't do anything else besides math. And so, um, you know, when I first started my teaching career, I was in Texas, and all I did was math. Didn't go to any of my students' uh, sporting events. Didn't, um, you know, particularly my first couple of years of teaching there, it was so much learning and developing that there was really nothing outside of my life besides teaching math. Um, and unfortunately for my students who had me the first couple years, I was this professional uh, teacher here on the left side, and I really didn't share very much of my, you know, 360 degree person that I was, all the different aspects about me. Um, and most of our students, when they come into our classroom, are probably more like the person that's tagging a car. I'm sure they don't do pi symbols on their, uh, when they're tagging things, but uh, they're not super professional, especially the ones that hate math. They're, they may be really grumpy when they come into your classroom. And so when we keep ourselves isolated in this perfect person that never makes mistakes, that, that only does math and, and anything else, nothing else matters, uh, a lot of times we can lose our students that way. All right, so uh, let's go into a little bit about who is Ellen Pikarski. Um, I have several different links here. I'm not gonna go into all of them, um, but you have access to these slides. You can go to these links and you can find out far more information about me than you ever wanted to know. Um, I, I do a lot of weird things and I didn't realize that there were so many articles written about me, that there were so many, so many things out on the internet about me. If you ever wonder um, what's out there about you, just Google your name and hopefully you have lots of things online. It's not just, you know, John Smith is a math teacher and that's it. You know, hopefully there's a lot of stuff. Um, so I have just tons and tons of stuff about me on here. A couple of things, a couple of the weird things I've done. Um, I, to, when I moved up to Alaska, I took a bunch of kids to uh, Scammon Bay and I ate moose snout. Yes, I ate the nose of a moose. Um, that was very weird for me. That was very, and when I tell my students this, they they do the ooh gross, and they they always ask me, what did it taste like? Um, and you know, my students really know way more information about me than they ever wanted to know, um, mainly because the very first day of class, I share um, tons of information about me. And I'm just going to show you a little bit. I'm not going to go too much into this. And um, because we were in, because of COVID this last year, I was teaching online, like most of you guys, most of you guys are probably teaching online. Um, either you're still doing it or, um, let me see, I know I can zoom in here. Sorry, whoa, too much. Um, either you're still teaching online or, um, you might be doing partial. So every year, first day of school, I do not go over any rules. First day of school, no rules. That's one of my number one rule is I don't go over any rules first day of class. I don't give out syllabuses. I don't do any of that. And the reason why is because most of the time the kids are just sleeping through your class anyway. They're not paying attention to it. Give it to them the second day of school or even the second week of school, it's okay. Um, what I do with my students when I, uh, with my math students is I give them a math problem and I give them all this information. If we're in class, then uh, I might have a slide presentation or I just might have this information spread out across, around the room and they have to move around it and figure out things about me. And then there's a math equation that they have to solve. Um, spoiler alert for every single year, every first day of class, the answer is always 3.14. Um, because I have my students call me Miss Pi and they think it's the coolest thing in the world. The funny thing is, is once they hear all these weird things about me, once they know that I had five kids, um, they never forget that information. Most of the time, first day of school, kids, the information goes in one ear and out the other. 
my students my in my class they love my class and they remember everything um months and months later when there's a new student that comes in they'll just start you know they'll they'll some of the my old students will ask me about some of my kids and they're the new kids are like how do you know about her kids and then they're like well the first day of class she told us about it or they always ask me can you demonstrate how to rotate your arms in opposite directions um so don't be afraid to uh share who you are with your students uh, and there's lots of ways to do it i always add a math equation to it so that they have to you know based on information about me they have to do some calculation it's an easy way to get them doing math the first day of school without giving them a worksheet nobody wants a worksheet the first day of school either um, lots more information here i'm going to move on because even though i think i'm an awesome person i'm a, i'm so amazing i'm sure you guys really don't care that much about me and if you do care thank you for caring and you can explore this other stuff on your own later let's talk about the kids who hate math um, some of these are uh, things that you've probably noticed as you have been teaching math uh, some of the kids that hate math have math anxiety that's why they hate math it's because they have math anxiety and i will caveat this with this these are stereotypes right um, not every person with math anxiety hates math not every beautiful person hates math. These are stereotypes uh, based on some of my years of teaching, some of the things I've noticed. Uh, people with test anxiety, they may be really great at math, but they hate math because they have test anxiety. And math teachers, I found, love to give tests. And we give sometimes two and three tests for each unit. Um, I've made a stance that I will only give one test per unit, and sometimes I don't give any tests per at all sometimes i just do a project um, kids that have low income also tend to not like math and uh, same thing with kids that are homeless and sometimes it can be a myriad of reasons maybe their parents were bad at math uh, so they think they're automatically inherently bad at math uh, being bad at math is not an inherent and uh, not a gene there's no like trait on our from our gene sequence that we get from our parents that cause us to be bad at math it doesn't exist but most kids think it does um, homeless i have i actually teach a lot of homeless kids if i gave them a worksheet they would throw it away um, they are too concerned with where they're going to sleep at night and what they're going to have for dinner to bother with the worksheet so i don't give worksheets to my students um, now, I'm sure some of you guys don't teach a lot of homeless people, so, you know, heck, give them as many worksheets as you want. Um, I've also had several students in my class that are diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, if you've never worked with people that have fetal alcohol syndrome or some of the side effects or, um, and if you ever have a chance to go to any type of, um, symposium or meeting where they talk about uh, the effects of alcohol on the brain of fetuses, um, please take advantage of that. It, I went to one a couple years ago, very fascinating. Um, most students with fetal alcohol syndrome, they hate math because they cannot memorize their multiplication table. They don't have their, their basic math facts. They have a very hard time memorizing it. And so they will be a 10th or 11th grader and still in a math class where the teacher is trying to get them to memorize their times tables. Um, that's very unfortunate. I hope if any of you guys are teaching a math class with uh, low level learners, I hope if you're in high school, you're not um, for trying to get them to memorize their math facts. It's just not gonna happen sometimes. Uh, kids with 504, any SPED accommodations, lots and lots and lots of accommodations for math. Um, athletes, <laughs> and again, this is a stereotype. I've actually had a lot of athletes that are very good in math, uh, but they don't have the time to spend two, three hours a night studying. And so they think they're bad at math. Um, there's ways around it. Uh, one of my first years teaching, I had a young lady in my class that was super pretty. She spent, she would wake up 
two hours before school started so she could start her makeup. Her makeup and hair was always perfect. Um, and she told me, I don't need to learn math because I'm gonna marry a rich guy and he's just gonna take care of me. So I won't need to learn math. Uh, I thought that was hilarious. And um, I worked with her all year. And by the end of the year, she was like, hey, I can, uh, I can, you know, I'm good enough at math that I could probably be an accountant. And so, you know, every student that hates math, they have this perception that um, they can't do math. Either they're really bad at it or they don't see a reason why they need math, okay? Um, lots of people are, people that are afraid of failure um, hate math. Because guys, we make mistakes all the time. Um, very rarely do we have all the right answers, okay? So here I have several, several, I have four. I have four um, quotes by some famous people about why failure is okay. Um, our students need to know that it's okay to not have the right answer. It's okay to not know the right answer, to not know how to answer it. Um, so my question for you guys is, most of these are pretty famous. Most of you guys have heard these quotes before. How many of you actually have them posted in your classroom? Okay. Uh, hopefully, at least one or two of these are posted in your classroom, if not all of them. Chances are having them all are posted are it's probably very unlikely because you know we all have very limited wall space. Um, but I love those quotes. Here's some more that uh, are from people that are not as famous. You may or may not know some of these guys. Go ahead and read through these. And in the chat box, just tell me which one of these quotes do you like the best? Uh, and you can just tell me the person, you don't need to type out the whole quote. Just tell me who, who said it. Um, I, I had tons and tons of quotes about failure and I wasn't sure which one is my favorite. I think the last one, failure is a bruise, not a tattoo. There's so many students that come into my class, very first day, I'm bad at math, I hate math. What can I do to get out of this class? Um, you know, most of our students are not, they, they think they are a failure in math, and so they think that they can't do math, okay? Um, So one of the things I wanted to talk about before we go on too much further is um, how you know how do how do we change their mindset? You know how do we how do we reach the kids that are just so terrified at math that they think there's they're always going to be a failure with it? Um, so so before we move keep moving on, I have two questions for you. The first question. And I want you to type the answer into the chat box, but don't don't push enter yet. Okay. So the first question is is what class did you hate the most when you were in school? Go ahead and type it in. Just what class was it? What you and you can do the subject or a specific class? I know for me, I used to love English, but my uh, sixth grade English teacher. Sixth grade English was the class that I hated the most. Uh, whatever your the class you hated the most, go ahead and put it in the chat box and go ahead and start, push enter. Let's see what our response is. Wow. PE, history, social studies, English. Um, yeah, wow. Lots of, lots of us have very strong opinions on <laughs> geometry. I'm a math teacher and I hate geometry, guys. Don't tell my students that, but I hate geometry. <laughs> um, and it could be it could be the subject or it could be the teacher. Hopefully, it wasn't the teacher. Um, but you know, we all have these very traumatic classes that we just really, really did not like. So now uh, Mike's going to send you a poll, everybody a poll. And the question is, what would you do to get out of whatever class you hated the most, what would you do to get out of that class, okay? Um, and I'll tell you some of these responses we got from our students. 
you know, we asked them, if you could get out of your hated class, what would you be willing to do? So go ahead, and you can and click on more than one answer. So go ahead and answer that poll. And while you're doing that, I want to share a story with you. Um, when a few years ago, I went to a summer camp with a whole bunch of native Alaskan kids and um, their language is called is Alutic. And so most of them are bilingual. They are very fluent English speakers, but they can also speak Alutic. And I am terrible at learning new languages, absolutely terrible. So if somebody had told me that there was a language class that we had to attend, I probably would not have gone on this camp. I love camping, I love being out in nature, and the camp was free uh, for me, um, and, but I hated this language class. I went into the class and uh, we had kids that were itty bitty, like kindergartners, you know. I think they had to be five and up to attend the camp, we had kindergartners that they were singing all the, the alphabet and Alutic and they were singing all these songs and they knew all the sounds and they could sing it and they, they knew which letters went with which sound and they could say words and, and they were so cute. And my coworker and I were sitting in the back watching them and trying to pronounce the words and stumbling around. And then the the teacher of this English language class said, and our, our adult guests are going to say, sing the alphabet for us. They've been practicing with us. Let's see how well they're doing. And I was terrified. I was horrible at it. It was my very first day at doing the class. And the kids were so, they were trying to cheer me on and so supportive. They only laughed a little bit when I messed up and they clapped, but, I was horrified. I could not say like hardly any of the letters. It was the worst experience of my life. And that came, that was my day one, that was a Monday. We were supposed to go to the language class every day of the week for the for a whole week. And you know, every day I was super busy during that language class. There was one time I had to sweep the, the floors in the dining hall. Uh, there was one time I was cleaning the latrines, guys. I I chose to clean not just a toilet, but an outhouse toilet instead of going to this language class. And on Friday, when we were getting ready to leave the last day of the class, I was doing avoiding class again, just like some of our students avoid our math class. And I realized that I was doing the exact same thing that about 95 of my math students do. They they will do whatever they can, have to to get out of class. They'll pretend to be sick. Nobody said they, oh, very few people, wow, two people said that they would be willing to eat a worm to get out of their class. Um, yeah, so several people did not want to answer, wow. Um, so some of these examples are things that our students are willing to do to get out of our of a class that they hate. Um, pretty scary, right? So pretending to be sick, eating a worm, cleaning a toilet, scraping gum off of the bottom of tables and chairs. If you guys have ever had to do that at school, it's gross. Uh, clip everyone's toenails at school. There's actually a student that would would prefer to do that over going to class and learning something. Uh, paying $400. Wow, there's a few of us that would be willing to pay $400 to get out of their class. All right, so, so hopefully this will give you a little bit more insight on what it's like for our students when they hate math and they have to go to math. Okay, so now let's talk about why do we teach math through activities or PBL. Um, math teachers have a million and one worksheets. There are so many worksheets that it's crazy. But the problem with worksheets is if they can do the worksheet, they don't need it. If they can't do it, it won't help them anyway. Um, we have crammed worksheets down their throats and they don't care. Nine times out of 10, if kids hate math, they'll get the answers for, for the worksheets. They'll get them from their friends. They'll look online for them. They won't even do that, or they just won't even do them at all. So it's not gonna help them uh, doing the worksheets. One of the things that I will tell you, um, 
the last time I graded any worksheet was over nine years ago. I've been teaching for, I've lost track of how long I've taught, um, about a month after or a month into my teaching career, I realized I was wasting my time grading the, the worksheets because they were just copying off of each other. So from that point on, I stopped grading worksheets. When I give my students worksheets, if I give them the worksheets, all the answers are posted on the board. If they want to copy them, they copy them. I'm like, you know, I'm just saving you a step. Instead of having to copy them from your neighbor, I'm just putting them on the board. What that does is they don't have to copy them anymore. Then they can try to answer it and then they will know immediately if they have the right answer. When you grade worksheets, it usually takes several days before you, you pass the worksheet back to them. And by then it's too late. They don't know it. It doesn't matter if they didn't know it. It doesn't matter because it's way too late. Um, so worksheets don't help at all. We teach math so our students can serve can solve real world problems. Um, I actually had a student tell me that her mom was a nurse and she never uses math at work. I, um, I was shocked and I said, wow, so how many, how many patients has your mom killed? And the student was very upset that I asked her that question. <laughs> and, and I asked her, I was like, okay, you think your mom doesn't use math at work. I want you to go ask your mom what type of math she uses at work. And for my student, when she said she didn't use any math at work, she was talking about the worksheet. Her mom doesn't answer any math questions on the worksheet um, because that's not how math is in the real world. When we are, are trying to solve real world problems, we need to know, we don't have worksheets. You know, the contractor isn't gonna give you a worksheet and say, you know, this is what you need to do to calculate how much square footage, you know, or how many supplies to order. That's not going to be in a worksheet. It's going to be real world scenarios like this. Okay. Um, math is important in life. Every kid needs to know how to do math. I went to I I went to Google and said, why do we need? <laughs> Thank you for those comments. Um, I, I, taught, I typed into Google, why do we need math? Um, I found this website, very fun w website, had paragraphs and paragraphs about all of these topics. These were the 10 reasons. Um, notice I said 10 reasons. This 11th reason that was not listed to solve math problems on a worksheet was not one of the options. It wasn't there. That is not why our students are learning math. So why do we teach them to solve math with worksheets, um, you know, why do we do that? Um, the problem is, is that, and this is the reason why, is because we have standardized tests and we have curriculum. Uh, so how how do we move away from teaching so they can pass their standardized tests to teaching how to solve math in the real world? Okay, so let's go ahead into how. Guys, there are so many PBL, project-based learning textbooks or, or books, how to teach PBL. Uh, there's also math activities, okay? So really quickly, I know, yes, PBL is very different than doing math activities. There is a huge difference there. Um, really, it's, it's quality and quantity, right? Um, and I support both. Sometimes when you're first getting into it, tr try just doing small activities, okay? Um, once you get comfortable doing small activities, try doing bigger activities, try doing projects, bringing them into the classroom. Lots of books, please check some of these out. If you've never looked at any of these books, check them out, they're amazing. One thing to know, for kids that hate math, uh, don't expect a perfect, projects don't don't expect perfect activities that go perfectly okay you're going to have some pinterest fails um, most of you know what a pinterest fail is this is what it should look like this is how it turns out you know this is what it should look like uh not the same right so yes the books are great just don't expect perfection most of the time this is what your classroom is going to be look like it, it's going to be a little bit crazy when you have activities uh, several times when my administrators come into my classroom, it's noisy. They won't find me up at the board. I'm 
sitting with a group of kids that are talking about math. Um, it's going to be a little bit crazy. Hopefully you can handle a little crazy. Um, quiet classrooms really disturb me at this point in my career. If my classroom's quiet, I know there's something going wrong. Something's not working. Math is not happening if the room is quiet, okay? PBL and act math activities are gonna look different for every classroom. And figure out what works for you. Uh, one of the things I do, I know every time we have projects, we always want our kids to have this perfect outcome, right? And so we'll show them examples of the perfect picture. Um, make sure they know it's okay if their project isn't great. Um, I, sh I showed these two projects and I said, guys, both of these projects pass. These are, these are passing grades for both of them. Now this one is a lot more detail, very, very well done, lots more formulas. This one they still did, uh, they, they fulfilled all the requirements and they did a great job. So let them know that it doesn't have to be this like 20 hour professional project that somebody from MIT came in and helped them do it, okay? Let them, let them fail, let them be okay without it having to be perfect. The other thing I would suggest when you're doing activities and projects, give your students voice and choice. Let them know, hey guys, next week we're gonna be uh, learning about exponential functions. Do you guys want to eat bacteria, play with M&Ms or become zombies? Which one do you guys want? And it's, it's crazy, I do this every year. Anytime I'm teaching about exponential functions, my I ask them this question and sometimes we take polls, sometimes uh, they can't decide and they say, well, whatever is the funnest thing, let, we'll do that one. And I'm like, okay, so Monday that we're going to start this project. It's amazing. I don't have any students absent on Monday when we are, when they know that we're doing some sort of activity, they're there and they're there on time. They don't even show up late. It's really fun. Um, and they always have extra questions, in the, especially with the eating bacteria. Why are we eating bacteria? What is it that we're putting in our mouths? And I said, you guys just have to choose. I'm not gonna give you more information. You choose and let's go from there. And, and I do tell them that we don't get to eat the M&Ms, um, but we do get to eat the bacteria and that is always puzzling to them. Sometimes they're kind of concerned, um, but they're always interested instead of, say, instead of dreading Monday, because we're talking about exponential functions, they're excited about Monday because we get to do some activity. Um, so give them choice. And then one of the things I do want to, uh, yeah, all right. I'm, I'm only getting some of the um, questions, but Mike, if there's any good questions, go ahead and interrupt me. Um, earlier, I talked about our, you know, standardized test and our curriculum. So most of you guys have a very supportive uh, school district that they give you um, the curriculum, they give you the standardized test, they tell you everything that you need to teach, they tell you how you should teach it, they give you a calendar. Um, how many of you guys have school districts that are that supportive, right? It's great. They my this is my this is a calendar for my school district. Every year they go through the whole calendar and they'd say you should teach this on this day and this on this day. So how do you incorporate all these activities when when you have a you have everything lined out for you already by your district. So my district is yeah, so they have this whole thing. They tell us what we should teach. They tell us how many days it should take. Um, I can click on this link and I have 43 pages. Guys, 43 pages of them outlining what I should teach, how I should teach it, when I should teach it, how quickly I should go through it. And I, I don't look, I only look at this page. This is the only page I look at. Don't tell my administrators. This is the only page I look at and I say, okay, these are the topics that we need. Um, sometimes I will, you know, I'll go in 3.1, 3.2, I'll go in and see exactly what it is I need to teach them. And I teach them the material. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I've found is that 
the way I teach the material, I get through the material much faster than their schedule. And I end up, a lot of times I have to add more activities, more projects because we've already gotten through it and I'm supposed to spend like five more days on it. Um, a couple things that allows me to do this. Number one, I have technology in my classroom and number two, I flip my classroom. So um, most of you, hopefully you were reading at the one of the first slides I was doing, I talked about how I flipped my classroom because I was tired of doing the exact same lecture six times a day. Um, you know, all the, the basic how to do this math, that type of thing, how do you factor? How do you, um, you know, what what is greatest common factor mean? What are all your definitions? Those things you can, instead of lecturing for 20 minutes, um, have the kids watch a YouTube video, okay? There are so many teachers that do YouTube videos about whatever subject, go to YouTube and um, you can type in whatever it is that you needed. So uh, if you need the t students to know about domain and range of exponential and logarithmic functions, type it in. You'll have lots of different options, okay? Tons and tons. You do not have to create the, create the videos yourself. Um, go to YouTube. YouTube is awesome. Okay. Lots and lots of different options. Uh, flip your classrooms, have them watch the video. Um, in fact, a lot of times I will pick a couple of videos and I, uh, their worksheets will be problems straight out of the video and they have to solve it. And I tell them, watch the video, solve these problems. I'll give them every problem that they have in the video I'll put on the paper and then I'll give them a couple extras to see if they know how to do it. Uh, you, what you'll find is um, students who are English language learners, they love um, having videos. The reason why is because they get to, um, they get to pause it, they get to rewind it, they get to listen to it again. When you're in the classroom and you're giving definitions and you're giving um, all this lecture stuff, please, please, please don't lecture in the classroom. Classrooms are where you get to have fun with your students, so have fun with your students. Let them watch all the lectures online. Um, they can watch it uh, before school, after school, during lunch, during tutoring. How, if somebody doesn't have internet at home, ask them to sit next to a partner and watch it. Have them come into class early and watch it. There's so many options, there's no, there's no reason why you should not have your students watching the lectures with YouTube videos or some video. If you feel like recording all your own videos, go for it. It's um, it's time consuming, but you know it's up to you. Um, I will share with you really quickly. I know we're getting kind of low on time. Um, I frequently have my student my I will have coworkers that will send me an email and say, Miss Pie so-and-so and so-and-so and so are watching one of your YouTube videos in the back of my classroom. And I, I will say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry that they're doing that during your class. And, and then they'll tell me, oh no, it's okay. We're not doing anything in class today. I, I don't know why a teacher would have students in their class and not do anything. Um, but students, there are those teachers out there. Students know which teachers can they, they can just do homework in their class or they can watch a YouTube video in their class. Um, there are so many options. Guys, those of you posting comments in the chat about uh, flipping your classroom, thank you. Those That's that's a great, great comments. Thank you for posting those. Um, anyway, so if you have not taken the opportunity of having your lectures be watched, on YouTube and then just having activities and playing in the math classroom, please tr just try it, give it a try, see how, see how it works. You will have students that say, hey, I don't like watching videos, can you just give me the lecture? Um, and I'll, I'll say, sure, come to tutoring and I'll lecture you. Um, you know, there are some students that don't like watching YouTube videos. They think they don't understand it. Um, and ask them to try it. Say, so give it a try. If it after a month it doesn't work, then we can do something else. Okay. Uh, all right. The other thing I said I did, I use a lot of technology in my classroom. Um, I I love technology, especially the Texas Instrument technology. My favorite calculator is the Inspire calculator. 
Um, I can project it onto my board. I can have my students. I have the, uh, like the top hats and the navigator and I have my students. They are the presenters and they will show the other students how to do whatever it is we're doing on the calculator. They'll show the other students on how to do it. Uh, another reason why I like the inspire calculators is all the, um, the steps that you use on Excel and Word documents, like the control C to copy, control V to paste, exact same steps, exact same shortcuts as you have on the calculator. Um, and use a lot of variety of technology. There's lots of things that you can do math with. Um, use the rovers. If you've never had an opportunity to uh, teach a math lesson with rovers, Try it out. The uh, Texas Instruments has lots and lots of different activities that you can do. And um, yes, the Inspire app is on the iPad. That's I love that app. Uh, and then the Rovers. There's so many fun things you can do with Rovers. Um, and you don't have to create the lesson plans yourself. Um, they're there. And the cool thing is, is if you don't have any Rovers, you can uh request texas instruments to send you like let's say you have um 30 kids in your classroom and you want to have groups of four or groups of five you can request te uh, rovers from texas instruments they will ship them to you for free you use them for your activities and then you ship them back for free uh free is awesome so definitely check out some of the activities that texas instruments has with rovers um, you do not have to create your own activities. You don't have to create your own math project ideas. Don't reinvent the well, the wheel, excuse me. Um, there's lots of options out there and I would just encourage you find something. There's lots, I'll have several links in a little bit, uh, find something you like. And even if you think, oh, this is not exactly what I need, go ahead and tailor it to your needs. Um, I used to teach, uh, pre-calculus and 90% of my projects were de developed for pre-cal students and now I teach at an alternative school where I'm lucky if I have a student that's needing, um, he, I, I'm lucky if I have a student in Algebra 2. And so instead of just never doing any of my projects, I decided, hey, you know, we have an extra week or two. Do you guys want me to show you how to transform different parent functions? And even though it's a pre-cal project, I don't tell them it's a pre-cal project. I say, hey, let me show you how to do this on the calculator and just play around with it and see what you do, uh, see what you can do. My students love it. And then when they're done, I tell them that, hey, you, this is pre-cal level work. And they're shocked that they were able to do something when at the beginning of the year, um, you know, they didn't know how to multiply or divide on their own. Here's uh, a couple other math resources, great online resources. Um, I love these very short warm up type activities do at the very beginning of your class. Um, I do some of these activities as soon as the bell rings. We do this, this activity and five minutes later we're done. And what I have found is some of these activities, my students love these activities. Um, and I don't have students coming in late anymore because I don't, you know, once after five minutes, we're moving on to something else. And if they miss it, they miss it. Uh, these are some really fun activities. Which one doesn't belong is another very short, you know, if you have five minutes left, uh, five minutes of time left at the end of class, pull one of these out. Hey, which one of these numbers doesn't belong? There's no wrong or right answers. These are great activities that pull the kids away from that worksheet of, you know, 20 different questions on the worksheet to answer to just think about math differently. Um, the Village Math Problems is a, a link that uh, a math teacher who teaches in a native Alaskan village created, and I love them. I use these all the time. Uh, this is another resource. Please, where, whatever state you're from, find what, what math projects apply to your state. There's so many really cool activities out there. If you find them, share them with, share them with people. They're great. A um, couple other math activities were, man, where did this hour go? <laughs> I'm, I hope that you guys 
No, I hope you check, take a look at the slides that are attached to this and please explore. There's so many fun activities. Texas Instruments has just amazing, amazing. I love this website, education.ti.com. If you've never gone to this, um, please check out this website. Most of you guys, you're on here because you, you know about this website. There are so many activities. If you have 84 calculators, go to the 84 activities, inspired um code activities stem activities science um there's so many amazing fun 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 activities on here um <laughs> yeah so there's there's lots of really great things um even if you are working remotely you can have your students do some of these activities okay if you're still doing um you know online teaching, which I'm sorry if you're still doing that. I know it's not very much fun. Uh, there's lots of these activities you can do remotely. Um, so just check them out. One of the questions I have for you guys is, most of you know the know of these activities. Which is your favorite? Of all the activities that you found on here, there's so many incredible activities. What is your favorite? Just put it in the chat box. Okay, um, lots and lots and lots and lots of math activities. Um, and what I found, especially with my students that hate math, is if you tell them they will always have access to a calculator and you will show them how to use a calculator and they're gonna be experts within, within two weeks of working with the calculator, they will be experts at it and they can teach their other teachers how to use them. Uh, that's very empowering super empowering for kids that hate math because they go from the kid that never gets the answers right to the expert and i tell my students at day one guys you will always have access to these calculators and um you're going to get so good at using these calculators that as we have new kids coming in you guys will be able to teach them how to do it having somebody that hates math to then become an expert and be able to teach somebody else how to use the calculators is so empowering. Um, yes, thank you for your comments. I've been, I've, I'm watching, I'm multitasking as I'm talking, I'm reading about some of these comments that you guys have had. Um, some of my favorite activities, I love these, the zombie activity. This Code Breakers one is fairly new. I don't know how many of you guys have uh, explored this one. It talks about ciphers and puzzles and you know, fun, fun points. And look at all these topics that you guys probably already talked to your students about. You probably already teach them. This is a different way to go about it. That's, I think it's a lot more fun than uh, doing, just giving them worksheets with formulas, okay? Rover projects, again, I've already talked about that. Some of the math projects that I have, again, these were specifically built for uh, my pre-cal students, but I use these projects with all of my students, uh, particularly the ones struggling math students should hopefully understand what it takes to finance a car. I do this activity with them and we talk about, we talk about interest, we talk about the power of compounding interest and making, uh, making minimum payments and what happens if you can't make the minimum payment, what happens if you have to pay smaller amounts and then versus making extra payments uh, and how that affects the their um, payments and how much they're paying in interest. Guys, this is a project that is a pre-cal level activity, but I do it with my, with every math class every year. And, you know, yeah, they may not understand annuities and they may not understand uh, compounded interest completely, but understanding how math works, how interest works in the real world is powerful. They need to know this, whether they're experts at math or whether they hate math. Um, they need to know how math works in the real world. So please, if you can, step back from your all those worksheets and show your kids how math really does work in the real world. Um, and again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's so many activities out there, tons of stuff on uh, Texas Instruments website, education.ti.com. Um, you'll have access to my these projects. Um, 
the pirate project i started that years and years ago and it's all about um they the kids have to go from one island to the next island they have to do vector we talk about vectors and magnitude and we talk about how um you know wind or water currents and all this fun stuff and guys one of the things i would suggest that you do as we're teaching all this math if you have a parent that works in some field uh, have them come in and share what how they use math. Um, doing this activity, I had a had a student whose dad was a pilot, and he shared he shared with his dad his activity of selling the ship to all these ports and all the different the the difference between uh, nautical miles and regular miles and the difference between um, uh, bearings and our unit circle. They he he shared this with his dad, and his dad came in. He he emailed me and said, "Hey, I'm a pilot. I'd love to talk to your students about this." I had him come in as a guest speaker. It was awesome. Uh, him being able to talk about how he was using math in the real world. Uh, the kids love the love that project. Um, they love. In fact, I even let them uh, make uh pirates hats out of newspapers and you would be amazed at how many high school students want to wear that pirate hat they want to have the the eye patch while they're doing this project it's it's hilarious it's super funny i would love to get uh, pictures and record it but for some reason as soon as the cameras come out those those pirate hats come off the pirate patch the eye patch comes off you know they they put that all away um so yeah, I've never been able to get a student to be willing to be recorded doing that. But um, my students love math after they leave my classroom. When they first come into my classroom, they hate math. They're like every other student, they hate it. Um, I work very hard to collaborate with my other teachers, other teachers at my school. Uh, all right, somebody said they can't hear. Right, can you guys hear me? I hope we can. Hopefully, Good yeah. On my okay, end. excellent. All right, maybe somebody was having internet issues. One of the downsides of uh, teaching online is the internet issues. Okay, uh, sorry. So let me back up. So collaborating with the other teachers, um, I had the wonderful opportunity a couple years ago. We we did theme based projects with each other. So there was a history teacher science teacher and English teacher, math teacher. I was the math teacher and we did projects with our students. These were some of the projects The So the Who Am I project, the English teacher had the kids write poems about that described who they are. They, they talked about biographies and the kids wrote biographies. It was really great. Um, so you can collaborate with other teachers, get them involved so that the you know, the science teacher is talking about viruses the same time you're doing the zombie activity. Okay, so there's lots of really awesome things that you can get do with your coworkers. Rope them in. Uh, we did a food truck pro project, and our science teacher talked about bacteria and foodborne illnesses, uh, viruses, and it was amazing the things that every day. You know, the English teacher went through, they did menus and they created uh, descriptions. It was really cool. This history teacher talked about food throughout the world. Um, and then I did all the math behind running a food business. So there's a lot of really cool things that you can do. Talk to your coworkers, even if they're not math teachers, uh, they can help and support you. All right, I've been talking for an hour. You guys have been a great audience. I've been watching all the um, the chat box. I haven't been able to answer very many of your questions, but if you have any more questions, please email me, pykarski.ellen at gmail.com. I will answer. Um, and please watch this again. Thank you for participating. I hope this was helpful for you. Thank you for all the ch comments you've put in the chat box. Um, and Mike, I will turn it back over to you. We have a drawing, right? You thanks so much, Helen. All right. So speaking of that drawing, uh, we're excited to be uh,
providing some TQ summer workshops uh, to uh, a place near you this summer. Uh, some are face-to-face -face and some are virtual. You can check out all, all what's being offered by visiting our website, education.ti.com forward slash T3 Summer Workshops. And as promised, tonight we're in the lucky winner is going to receive a TQ Summer Workshop registration. And tonight's lucky winner is Jeffrey Bitten. So Jeffrey, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days to give you some more information, Jeffrey. Uh, but we hope to see Jeffrey as well as everyone else at a T-Cubed Summer Workshop. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click the link I just posted in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that Ellen and I use tonight. Uh, don't forget that uh, there's lots of links that are active in Ellen's uh, PDF PowerPoint that she didn't go over tonight. Uh, so spend some time with that and click on some of those links. They're really interesting. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. And if for any reason uh, these links in the chat window aren't working for you right now, just hang tight. You should automatically get a follow-up email from us within a couple days. And that follow-up email will contain a link to the recording, links for the certificate and the documents as well. Feel free to continue the conversation that will start tonight. Reach out to us on any of the major social media outlets. If you're in need of any post-webinar follow-up or have any questions, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or drop us an email, ti-cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. When you leave the webinar, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events, and we really hope to share your thoughts in that post-webinar survey. Big thanks to Ellen. Thanks so much for putting all this together. I know this takes a lot of time and uh, for sharing so many personal experiences. So, Ellen, thanks so much. You're welcome, Mike, and thank you guys for being here. I hope I gave you some food for thought, and please enjoy the rest of the school year. Absolutely, and thanks again for everyone joining, everyone who joined us. We hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.